Uh, are we Perhaps. ready? Perhaps. Can you check with Chad? Are we ready for a countdown? Um, Chad, are you ready? And welcome back to this new podcast uh, brought to you by Flashunda in conjunction with Chad Ray and EmeraldTV.com. My name is Dennis Bernstein here with Miguel Gavila Molina uh, and Sarah Schrader. And we continue uh, uh, delving deep into, well, marijuana, medicinal marijuana, the struggle to make safe uh, uh, and affordable uh, marijuana, medicinal marijuana available. Uh, we are going to be talking about a number of uh, issues, and I'm bringing in Sarah to uh, lay out the panel. So I had the pleasure of serving on the Cannabis Advisory Group here based in Sonoma County, which was a board of supervisors appointed a position. And I am inviting here today with me, Terry Garrett, who is co-chair of the advisory group, as well as Omar, who sat on the advisory group with us. Omar Figueroa is a local attorney, and both of them are here to tie in, uh, talk about the accomplishments that we had during our time on the Cannabis Advisory, as well as what we didn't accomplish, and how that impacts our county. We've seen a lot of changes financially financially related to our industry, and that has had a lot of trickle-down effect on some of our small businesses. Uh, Terry Garrett co-authored the Economic Impact Report here in Sonoma County, which really highlights what some of these changes look like for our community. And I also invited Joanna Cedar. She is a public affairs manager with Canacraft, and she also was very active at our meetings, and she's currently working on future hemp policy through the Department of Ag, uh, as they recently put together their, their own um, cannabis advisory, or I'm sorry, hemp advisory committee, and that is through Tony Linegar. Um, so welcome all of you for, uh, thank you for joining us. And maybe Omar, you can start by talking a little bit about the committee reports that we drafted and the work that it took to get us there. Well, um, there was definitely a lot of collaboration between some um, Sonoma County um, neighbors or neighborhood group members who we're very opposed to cannabis at first, and um, us, like we had you know, many meetings that did result in significant compromises and, and ability to find common ground. So I thought that was amazing that people who live in the same county can really, really look past their differences and find things to agree on. At the same time, I would say that the Sonoma County Cannabis Advisory Group was merely an advisory group, and we did not have any enforcement power we did not even have the power to make the supervisors listen to us. And we felt ignored by the supervisors in the end. They uh, did not really attend the meetings, did not respond to the feedback that we gave them, did not adopt the recommendations or respond to the recommendations. So in a sense, it's, they created this um, advisory group that you know, in retrospect, was more of a talking chamber that where they could kind of like put the discussion and contain it within that talking chamber. Omar, talk about how these multiple struggles have impacted the rollout and the ability for people to get safe and affordable medicinal marijuana because there are some big problems here. Yes, I, I think the main problem is um, um, before Proposition 64 and the restrictive permitting system, um, we really had freely available cannabis to seriously ill patients. And that's because uh, people who were members of collectives and cooperatives always kept an eye out for the seriously ill patients in case they ever needed um, to justify their operations in a criminal court, in a criminal, as a defense, as a collective or cooperative defense. So, um, you know, it was definitely a time when if you were a seriously ill patient, you didn't have to worry about coming up with money to get your medicine because there's always cultivators who were looking for patients like that um, to help. Now, with a new, um, I would say, regulated, commodified, industrialized system that we have now, those patients, the ones who need the access, who need the most cannabis of the highest quality and the greatest quantities the most, can't obtain it unless they can afford it. And it's not now commercially viable for these cannabis enterprises to uh, set aside 
uh, cannabis for these types of patients because it's not in the regs, it's not in the law, there are no incentives structurally for it. This is Dennis Bernstein here with Sarah Schrader and Miguel Gavilan Molina. I want to uh, bring you into this, Joanna Cedar, uh, and have you respond to multiple struggles. Talk about uh, uh, life since the rollout. Well, we have a long history of cannabis cultivation in Sonoma County. In fact, we grow three crops in Sonoma County. One is cannabis, the other are wine grapes, and the final is livestock. And this is how we've, we've used our land over the last generation since, um, since we've shifted from apples and pears. And um, it's, it's very, really quite sad because at the end of 2017, we had an estimated 5,000 to 7,000 small farmers in Sonoma County that were, some of them diversified farmers, supplementing their income and providing medicine locally to the people who need it. And with the, um, with the development of both local and state regulations, um, zoning restrictions locally have essentially eradicated the legal Sonoma County cannabis business sector. And it's somewhat scary to watch what is happening both from the supply side and families that can no, that no longer have the income that cannabis brought them, but also um, in local, cannab local cannabis dispensaries, they're not able to sell local product. And so the economic, imp the economic impacts are really quite grave for our community. And, and looking at that whole question, Miguel. thank you, Dennis. Uh, looking at the whole question of, uh, you know, access, particularly for, let's say, patients or elderly patients uh, that are on, you know, limited salaries, limited budgets themselves. I mean, with, with the whole kind of phasing out of the compassion, you know, there used to be a, a, a clause where uh, dispensary groups would be giving out, you know, uh, cannabis, you know, to uh, patients that were low income or were on a limited budget themselves. But with the whole industrial uh, and, and adult use coming in, it's kind of just like pushed that away, disappeared. How can... What does that do with people that are in desperate need? Because now the dispensaries, I mean, there is no, seems to be no like uh, uniform uh, uh, pricing on the products. I mean, you go to one town and it's, you know, uh, it, it might be cost you so much. You go to another uh, district or another area, there's no conformity on pricing, you know, or even, uh, uh, you know, being able to, uh, look at the difference between commercial for adult use and medicinal. How, what has happened there? And, and what is going to happen now that it looks like big ag has taken over? And politicians uh, uh, that were convinced, uh, you know, I've seen a trend where a lot of politicos now are even, you know, uh, you know, buying stock in companies, some of these big agricultural, uh, I say, corporations that are coming in. I mean, it's unbelievable to see how many politicians are now, you know, jumping into things and they're forgetting about the patients that need the medicine the most. So Terry Garrett is here with us from Mercy Wellness, and maybe he can share us with us a little bit about the trends of um, uh, purchasing uh, after the changes here with legalization. Uh, so just to end cap, what uh, Joanna was saying about the loss of income in Sonoma County, because this is kind of the starting point for what happened after that, uh, and I've go back about three years. So before Prop 64, uh, Sonoma County, and it, it, this is kind of hard to figure out because the, there were no public records or third-party data or anything. We had to literally go out and just interview uh, people and then take some estimates from there. But uh, Rob and I, Rob Eiler uh, from SSU was the co-author on this report. We estimate that there was a loss of one billion dollars in Sonoma County. And you, you have to um, you have to imagine this is the long tail uh, on a distribution curve going out of thousands of small family type growers that were maybe making a quarter million a year, half million a year gross, take home maybe a hundred thousand. This was supplemental income for a lot of folks. Uh, it was a second income. In some cases it was primary. But when you 
count that among thousands of people as opposed to a few hundred, it has a very far-reaching impact in the economy because this is a Sonoma County is a $25 billion gross domestic product for the county. So a billion dollars is, you know, nearly 5% of that. And so if you think of the impact on a grocery store, on a restaurant, on a dry cleaner, on a, any, yeah. any small business that relies on that cash flow uh, from that, that was the impact. Um, and so uh, that was the first part, because what that did was decimate the supply chain. And through the report that we did, we recognized the value of each link in that supply chain. And the more those are uh, vibrant on a local market, the higher the economic returns to the community. There's a thing called a multiplier, an economic multiplier. And what that means is that if along the supply chain, cultivation starting, so the farmers first, uh, manufacturers and processors, distributors and retailers, the more we can verti vertically integrate locally so that we're growing we're processing locally, we're distributing locally, and we're selling locally, it adds a premium to that, which uh, in the case of, if you look at a billion dollars, it can be as high as almost 300 million wow. additional benefits come to the community when you do that. And so when the, uh, the why the regulations at the county level impacted that, and we should contrast that with some of the cities, like Santa Rosa has been giving a faster track, uh, well, faster relative <laughs> to most <laughs> land use stuff, which is, you know, an eternity when you're waiting on it. Um, but at least they're more ambitious to establish a cannabis market versus the county, which is right the opposite. And just that patchwork of stuff left a lot of people sitting on some very valuable real estate that they just can't even use anymore. I mean, it's it's gone. So that drastically impacted. For Mercy, as an example, nearly 90% of our flour uh, was purchased in Sonoma County pre-2017. Today, it's probably not even 5%. That's the drastic change to go from 90% to about 5%. That shows up in loss of revenue for all these other local companies that aren't even cannabis companies. Joanna, did you want to jump in here? Absolutely. And local electeds and business leaders have been essentially toned up to this argument over the last year and instead have looked at every downturn in Sonoma County, the Sonoma County economy as an, a result of the fires. And there was a really easy way, and there is a really easy way for economic, the Economic Development Board, and um, local leaders to track this and to start asking local businesses how much money or that they or how much of their business that was conducted in cash in 2017 evaporated in 2018 because that's a pretty good indication that those were cannabis dollars you're listening to a new podcast uh, brought to you by uh, Flashunda. Uh, this is the 420 podcast in collaboration with Chad Ray and EmeraldTV.com. Uh, and we'll, we're talking uh, uh, big time about uh, cannabis, the legalization, what has happened since the rollout, and all the things that are going on around that. I'm uh, joined also, honored to be joined by Sarah Schrader. Uh, she's the chair of Sonoma Chapter of Americans for Safe Access. And uh, while well, she's on on the uh, Cannabis Advisory Board, uh, or was, it just sunset out. Say a little bit more about what we've been listening to here, about the, the, the multiple struggles that people are facing since the rollout. And really, it does seem like we're, we're looking down the barrel of uh, sort of 7-Eleven corporate marijuana. Uh, that's the next step. I agree. I think the intent of the Sonoma County uh, Cannabis Advisory Group was to get uh, input from the community on how to make this a successful program and how for we can transition our existing players to be a part of a legal program. 
Unfortunately, what we've created is hurdles that are so high that our small players can't get through anymore. And when we are disconnected from our politicians, when they are having private meetings as ad hocs and not sharing their minutes with us, and they're not participating in our minutes, then there's dis this disconnect between policy being made with government and policy being made by the community. And we need to see a better merge there. Uh, I think that all of us have a lot of expertise and guidance that we could have provided had they wanted to listen. And uh, you know, we have good intent to start our own equity programs, to lower the barriers of entry, to figure out how we can increase our economic benefits here in this community, but without working with us long term, or without listening to this work, then that leaves us uh, in a place where we're stuck. Um, you know, I'm hopeful that the hemp group can do a little bit more for the Department of Ag because that's been one of the most successful departments that we've seen in Sonoma County. But ultimately, it's up to every community in their state to write policies that's going to work for them. Uh, equity programs need to be tailored to their own communities. Who do we want to see as permitted applicants in the future? And I think that all of us here in Sonoma are really saddened and disheartened by how many small farmers we've lost. So looking at ways that we can reduce the cost and uh, reduce the barriers of entry, uh, find financial programs to support these individuals, are all ways that we're going to see success in the future. But right now it really feels like the burdens are stacked up against us because it is uh, uh, much easier for companies that have more money. Uh, but I think that even our tax rates are impacting those players. I'd like to, maybe we can go around the horn here and talk about the what does the battle look like? What kinds of struggles are you all prepared, preparing to fight? What do you do uh, day by day to sort of rescue this, uh, uh, this beautiful, magical drug back from the corporatizers and the people who put all this, you know, who have forced all this incredible, uh, devastating packaging that's killing the environment and really, the packages, you, do, you need to hire a, uh, a, a second story crew to break into the packages. You can't, anybody who has problem uh, with, with arthritis and is trying to buy some medicine <laughs> to feel better cannot open the freaking pack. I mean, every, uh, you know, I keep remembering, I, I keep thinking about this. Somebody pointed out once to me that uh, Coca-Cola is not a soda company. It's a bottling company and they make money on the bottles. And, you know, here we go again. Let's kill the environment, turn uh, this uh, beautiful potential into a corporate uh, uh, profit motive operation. Omar, you want to jump in? Let's, let's hear about your response to this. How do you fight back? Well, I guess, um, you know, there's many people are, are trying to navigate the regulations and they're, First, they look for municipalities that are, have more business-friendly provisions. Uh, so some ordinances, like um, the Sonoma County Ordinance, is not as amenable for operators as other cities within so Sonoma County. So, for example, we see the city of Katari, the city of Santa Rosa, the city of Sebastopol um, are where the businesses are located. And so they're basically looking for a friendly home and that requires um, being very aware of what the local jurisdiction policies are, what the tax rates are. Some local jurisdictions used to be uh, business friendly, but then they enacted these tax rates like Oakland. And you know now the tax rate is killing the Oakland businesses, whereas back in the day, Oakland was a trailblazer jurisdiction and it was a great place to move. And the reason they were able to pass that ordinance and become trailblazers is because it was sweetened with this tax. And so now it's time to evolve beyond the tax. But what do you do? I guess for me as a lawyer, I help my clients try to navigate this. I want to help people who work with cannabis who are actually interested in the plant and helping people with the plant and who actually use cannabis. Um, you know, like, would you ever buy wine from somebody who doesn't drink wine? Yeah or that to me is always like, um, you know, a red flag when I encounter somebody who purports to be interested in cannabis, but has no personal enthusiasm. I think from a, I kind of wear a few different hats, but speaking from the standpoint of uh, someone who has businesses along the supply chain, it is truly 
the uh, taxes that are exorbitant. We just collect it and pass it along, right? But the consumer pays it. And right now, at a retail level, roughly 49% of every dollar that comes in goes to taxes. And who pays for that is the consumer. Who makes the money? The government. Uh, but the government, uh, and as Rob and I illustrated in our economic impact report, the government isn't delivering the value on those taxes, either to the public nor to the businesses. They've disincentivized the public by adding 49% to the price of everything. Um, and so, and this is, uh, is multi-layered, so it's not just local, it's local, state, and federal. All together, the combination is creating a powerful disincentive for consumers to buy because it's jacked up the prices. And we watched it on the day it converted, uh, and for several months thereafter, our average sale was X number of dollars. And when the 15% excise tax kicked in, people still bought that amount, except they were getting 15% less product now because that was going to this excise tax. Mm -hmm. and, and so essentially, again, penalizing the supply chain uh, for having to keep their prices even lower and in some cases below cost just to uh, meet the demand and keep the prices so that people can actually afford to pay for it. So that's been one, and so the biggest hurdle for us, first of all, is just navigating the influence and impact, negative impacts of taxes on this. The time, uh, and when you add taxes, it's compounded by the fact that we operate in cash. So now, I mean, if you can imagine what a half million dollars looks like in uh, bundles of 20s and 50s, put that in a duffel bag and taking that to the IRS office in Santa Rosa, and just what a hassle that is. They have to have armed security uh, help you uh, get in the building to go to the place. I mean, this it's just, it, it's so much labor, it's unbelievable. And I have some of the sales tax offices who receive it in cash, spend an entire day of four or five employees having to count it and verify the amounts. So these, that combined with the taxes, with onerous and unclear regulations uh, that change frequently. It causes massive problems just in trying to calculate where you are, the metric system, which is track or trace. They want to track the product from its origin all the way through to its final uh, sale. Uh, that requires software, and it requires people to develop software uh, that integrates with the metric system. That takes forever, and it's not working just yet, and now we're expected to do it, and they started, uh, these are just decisions that are made at a government level. They started with retail to go into metric, which is totally crazy because retail is at the end of that, and all these products should have been tagged at the cultivation and manufacturing and distribution mm -hmm. level before it ever gets to retail. Now we have to do all that work just because they didn't time that. So these are just problems, uh, and I'm not going to use the word incompetence, but it feels like that when you're on the re receiving end of just bad judgment, uh, of like not understanding the industry. And I think, as to Sarah's point, the industry folks had that information available to inform people. This is how our industry works. This is how the business works. This is how the, the supply chain flows. Uh, but they didn't get a lot of that. I won't say they didn't get any, because they obviously made some effort towards this. And uh, it's hard to, I, I have to say, it's uh, for those of us in the industry who are daily frustrated with this, it's hard to not use words like incompetence and boneheaded and all these kinds of things. Other and that's cause, because that's what it feels like yeah. mid times. It, it would have, um, I think that our governments have become very financially rapacious at this point, and particularly to this industry, which they did not treat the alcohol industry this way. Even to this day, alcohol in this state pays less than 40 cents a gallon excise tax, which comes out to such an infinitesimally small percent of 1%, so move a few decimals in on that of what the value of that product is compared to 15%, and that punishment is to the consumers. This uh, question is for you, Terry, and Omar, um, and it deals with uh, taxation and regulation. 
you know, with when you, you brought up alcohol, Terry, you know, right. with alcohol, it's like standard. You go here, you go to San Diego, it's the same tax, it's the same, yep. you know, uh, regulations. Why is it that with cannabis, like, for instance, uh, uh, a dispensary here in the local area, uh, you know, will be charging you X amount in a tax. Now you go to the East Bay, it's a little different. It seems like, you know, not only counties, uh, but municipalities, all th th there's no conformity in like pricing, in taxation, regulation. Why is that? Everything else, you know, eventually gets conformed. You know, under this is a price for this amount, uh, you know, it, it involves everything, distribution, marketing, the whole, the whole package. Why is it so much different for this? Why haven't they decided, hey, the tax here in Santa Rosa is going to be the same in, in San Francisco, in Los Angeles, and elsewhere? Why, is, why haven't they figured that out yet? It's crazy. It's almost, you know, I remember before the, uh, the adult use, you know, the, the, uh, and recreational use, uh, you know, uh, boards of supervisors, city officials were all looking, you know, uh, starry-eyed, you know, seeing money, and they were looking into the future and using some of the, their future estimations on, you know, the taxes. Sure. Well, wait a second, that isn't real. Why did that happen, and why is it where it's at now, where there's no conformity? Um, well, I think, you know, if you do look at alcohol, though, I mean, there, there was a time, there was a transition time. You have wet and dry counties. You, you have local control. And I don't think that's a bad thing. I think local control is, is pretty good. And in, in this instance, it had to do, though, more with uh, it wasn't like a black and white, either ban it or don't ban it. They allowed all of this. Well, if you're not going to ban it, write your own regulations that matches the population uh, desires in your in your locality I don't think that's a bad thing I think what's happened because those taxes are small in comparison I mean if you like Katati has a three percent tax that they add onto it and some people are exempt from it uh, and don't have to pay it that's not been a big barrier for us it's the 15 percent and then the other sales right, tax and right. stuff like that that were onerous with that I think that it's been a little bit of a problem for companies who have to straddle a lot of different localities and they have to prepare their stuff to match the localities. That becomes more of a business inconvenience uh, for sure. I, I, think, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing though to have local control uh, over stuff like this, even if it is a little bit inconsistent, uh, but that's just my if you look at the history of who has been in working in Sacramento, two of the biggest opponents about, against cannabis uh, before our regulations were League of Cities and Counties and the Police Chiefs Association. And so as we're drafting these regulations, I'm sure that a lot of negotiations are being made. And I am pretty confident that the cities and counties wanted to keep the power in their own jurisdictions to draft their own laws. That includes whether or not they're going to have a dispensary, distribution, manufacturing, what their tax rates are going to be. And so keep in mind with any bill that's being written, there's negotiation that happens. That way everyone can come in agreement to support it. So I really believe that it's the League of Cities and Counties that wanted to keep that power locally as opposed to having uniformity in the state. That makes things difficult for me as an educator though. In the past, patients have been able to call me and I've been able to tell them as long as you're less than eight ounces and stay off of federal property, uh, you know, you're safe. Uh, but when we're looking at regulations that are so much more complicated, I'm literally saying, give me your zip code and I'll get back to you in a week because every city and county has different rules about how many plants they're allowed to have, whether they're indoor or outdoor, whether they have to be locked up, whether they can be seen from public view. And what we've created is a very complicated educational process for even individuals to be able to follow the rules. Well, on the topic of taxes, you know, if somebody wants to donate medical cannabis to a patient, they have to pay the cultivation tax, the excise tax, and on top of that, the sales and use tax. And so there's currently some uh, legislation that is underway, SB 34, that would allow cannabis donations to be tax-free because of those tax um, penalties that are imposed on people giving away medical cannabis. It's no longer free to give away cannabis. Now it costs money to give away cannabis and greatly disincentivizes um, donations to patients who are in need. So it's really important that um, the law and, you know, this SB 34 is like, 
slow to come corrective action that's taking forever to make its way through the legislature. I can't <laughs> believe it's taking this long. It's like yeah. just like a no-brainer, you know. It, it shouldn't require, first of all, we shouldn't require SB 34 to correct, you know, wrong-headed law, wrong-headed administrative decisions that basically wanted to provide, uh, prohibit just giving away pot to people. And so in the act of uh, prohibiting pot giveaways, they didn't really think about the patients who need to get cannabis for free. But, um, you know, there is, I guess, now legislative fix that's on the horizon, SB 34. And I would encourage listeners and viewers to reach out to their local politicians and urge uh, co-sponsoring and supporting SB 34. Joanna, before we uh, wrap it up, you want to talk about your perspective and your ideas for solutions to some of these uh, uh, difficult struggles? Well, I think to start, it's really philosophical, and that is to get rid of the artificial barriers that have been erected by government because of their fear of cannabis. And those barriers take the form of zoning and jurisdictional matters that make it impossible for, in Sonoma County, for example, um, people who live on um, rural residential parcels to um, have a commercial cannabis business. Um, at the at the um, at the state level, the fact that we cannot transport yet THC products across state lines really puts our local cannabis businesses at a serious disadvantage. We grow some of the best flour in the world in Northern California, and people want it in other states, and it's really disappointing that we're not able to take advantage of that and to brand the Appalachian environment, the standards, the practices, the varietals, the legacy producing regions that we have in, in Northern California and use that in other states. But I think really the elephant in the room is really gonna be the development of hemp policy and legislation um, at every jurisdictional level on the planet. Right now, the way it stands is we are building a regulatory system that is separate and based on THC level. And that is going to be extraordinarily challenging to implement. It's going to be in, in challenging to enforce. And ultimately, it does not serve the patient and the consumer. So when I look at solutions, I look at three different jurisdictions that we need to work on solutions for. Every city and county has their own authority to put in their own rules, and so that means every small community needs to be working on having a dispensary or micro businesses in their own backyard. Um, we can uh, create a lot of opportunity here, whether that's streamlining the process, creating equity programs, supporting small farmers, finding ways to lower the barrier of entry, that way people can start participating in their own backyards and in their own communities, and provide providing incentives for businesses that are doing things the way we want them to do. You know, rather than having things done as requirements, we should really be incentivizing the way we want to see uh, the cannabis programs work out. When it comes to the state, I think taxes are a huge burden. As long as it's cheaper for the cannabis patients to go to the unregulated market, then we have very little incentive for them to participate in the regulated one. So bringing those prices down seems to be through permit costs, seem to be through taxes. And I know that there's a lot of bills that are being considered in uh, Sacramento right now, but the three that are near and dear to my heart are AB 305, which is uh, the Ryan's Act. This would allow for use in hospitals hospitals. Uh, we also have AB 34, which Omar mentioned, which would allow for compassion to be issued without having to pay taxes on it. Um, and then we also have the schools bill, SB 223, which would allow for access in schools by caregivers. And certainly we'd like to see some amendments to those bills, but when we're looking at the intent of our initial Prop 215 law, we're uh, sometimes forgetting the people that this was intended for. If people can't use it in the hospitals, if they can't use it as needed during their daily regimen while they're uh, getting their education, then uh, we're, we're forgetting those that we intended to help here in the beginning. Uh, that is the voice of uh, the host of this new podcast. Uh, we thank you so much, uh, 
uh, Susan Trader. We're going to continue. Uh, this is a new podcast. Welcome, uh, as we say, to our 420 podcast. This is in collaboration with Chad Ray and EmeraldTV.com. This is Miguel Gavila Molina, and uh, we will continue uh, to cover this issue in a way uh, that makes sense and gives you a deeper look at what the multiple struggles are since the rollout of uh, legal medicinal marijuana in the state of California. The battle continues. Stay tuned. <laughs>